And welcome everybody. I'm so glad that you're all here with us tonight. And I'm so glad to be here virtually with all of you. It's wonderful to see all your faces. Um, now I'm going to share my screen. Um, let's see, Cheryl, can you um, let me share my screen? I think you need to let me do that. But I'm so excited to be here tonight. Um, talking with you about the McDonald family and more specifically about the McDonald sisters and their work with the Montana Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. So let me share my screen now, there we go. Okay, here we go, okay. The McDonald sisters' lives of resilience. So like I said, I've, um, I'm excited to be here tonight to share this presentation with you. And first and foremost, I would like to give a big shout out to the Montana Historical Society for their support and helping me to do this research. I applied for and received the Dave Walter Fellowship, which helped me in part complete this research. So a big thanks to them. It is so appreciated. It really, um, these fellowships really help um, people like me do this research, get to these archives and do this research. So I'm really thankful to them for that opportunity and they are the sponsor of this presentation this evening. So this presentation could not come at a better time in light of Black Lives Matter and recent protests for social equity. At Extreme History Project, we support the Black Lives Matter movement because every day when doing historical research, we see the injustices played out for people of color in this country. This presentation tonight is dedicated to validating this very important history and expanding the traditional historical narrative to include people and stories that have often been excluded, like that of the McDonald sisters and the Black women's movement of Montana. I've been researching and thinking about the McDonald family for, for many years now, and many of you have heard me talk about these um, sisters and the, and the McDonald family in general. So I'm so excited to introduce all of you to them so, so that you can get to know them as well. So let me start off by introducing you to Richard and Mary McDonald. And like I said, if, there, if the block is kind of blocking the, the view of Mary McDonald, you can just kind of grab that and move that around so that you can actually see all of, all of her. But um, Richard and Mary McDonald were both born enslaved in Missouri. They lived 20 to 30 years of their lives enslaved. They were freed in 1863, possibly in conjunction with the Emancipation Proclamation that happened on, on January 1st of that year. When freed, they immediately came west to Montana Territory, arriving in Virginia City after a six month journey. Can you imagine that? Ugh. Um, Mary didn't like Virginia City though. She said it was too rough and ready for her, which it probably was, it was a pretty rough town at that time. So they decided to settle in the newly formed Bozeman City. And they arrived in Bozeman in 1864. They actually arrived in Bozeman in the fall of 1864. And so Bozeman was founded in August of 1864. So they were here right from the get-go. So they were early settlers of this town. Richard hauled freight for a living, among other things as well. He died in 1898, and Mary died at 100 years old in 1941. So she lived to be um, quite old. Richard built this house that you see here when they came to Bozeman. It was originally a log cabin, but eventually he added the second story and um, put on the clapboard siding that you see today. This house is located and still standing at 308 South Tracy Street, right here in Bozeman. So if you're ever um, driving down Tracy, take a look. It's on the, um, it's on the um, east side of the street. So check it out if you have a chance. It's a beautiful little house. Richard and Mary had a fairly large family, which included four sons and three daughters. Unfortunately, none of the sons survived to adulthood, but luckily all three of the daughters did. 
Those three daughters are the topic of this presentation this evening. Molly, here on the left, was born in 1873. She grew up here in Bozeman and worked at MSU at Montana State University for quite a long time as the head cook at Hamilton Hall. Um, that photo she is taken with is, um, shows her and her daughter, Belle. And I'll refer to the daughter Belle as Little Belle most of the time, or Belle Fisher, which was her married name. Um, but this was a photograph of Molly and Little Belle when they went on a trip to California. So you can see the beach background setting there. So that was a trip that she took. Um, Molly grew up here in Bozeman, but she was a little wide ranging. She lived in Butte for a time. She lived in Livingston for a time. So, so she did move around. Um, she married a, a man by the name of Charles Ward and had two children, Little Belle that you see here, and then a son by the name of Richard. And, um, and then she also married again later in life to a man named Charles Gross. So you'll see her um, name here kind of referred to as Molly Gross sometimes as well. So the second picture is of the next uh, McDonald child, Belle McDonald, who was born in 1874. Belle also grew up here in Bozeman, and um, she lived in Bozeman most of the, she lived in Bozeman her entire life. Um, she, unlike Molly, didn't move to Butte or anywhere else. She just stuck here in Bozeman. She worked as a domestic servant, is what it was called in the census records, but basically she worked as a housekeeper um, and in various houses, but one of the houses she worked in was the Fielding House. And the Fielding House is on Wilson Street. It's one of those big, beautiful houses. And she worked for the, the Fielding family, Fred and Eddie Fielding. And she was a, a live-in servant there. So she actually lived with them in that house for a time. And after Fred died, um, she was a, a constant companion to Eddie Fielding. And Eddie and Fred were very wealthy. And so when Etty died in, um, I don't remember the year, but when she died, um, Belle and her must have become close because she gave Belle a third of her estate in her will, which was wonderful um, because that money kind of sustained these McDonald sisters through their retirement and into old age. And then some of the, the furniture from the Fielding House um, was given also to Belle. So some of the, the furniture that the McDonald sisters had in that house at 308 South Tracy for many years came from the Fielding family. So then the last sister is Melissa McDonald that you see on the right there. And, um, and I'll show a little bit of a younger photo of Melissa here in a little while, but Melissa was born, she was the youngest daughter, born in 1878. And Melissa um, grew up in Bozeman, lived in the family home, and she stayed, she always lived in the family home. She was the one who stayed, stayed home and was the caretaker for her mother, Mary, and then was the caretaker of her two sisters as they grew older as well. And so Melissa um, and uh, Melissa and Belle never married. Um, Molly was the only one of the three sisters that married. And I kind of wonder if that's because um, the three sisters came of marrying age um, right about the time that Montana passed an anti-miscegenation law in 1909, making it illegal to marry anyone outside of your race. So white people could not wear, marry black, Chinese, or Japanese people and vice versa. Um, and this law was on the books until 1953. So these three women grew up as a second generation to those who settled Bozeman. Their parents, Richard and Mary, were the first generation and these three were the second generation. They were born in grew Bozeman, grew up in Bozeman, and lived here. As you can see, they, um, Molly died in 1958, Belle in 1950, and Melissa in 1967. So all three sisters um, grew up with Bozeman. Uh, they literally saw this town go from a small, small, sleepy agricultural village to a college town to an economic hub reflecting our booming economy today. They lived through the Reconstruction era, the Progressive era, and the Civil Rights era, experiencing these great shifts in our nation's history. And even though they lived in Montana, they felt these shifts as well. 
on a local level, the three sisters were very much part of the Bozeman community, but especially Belle and Melissa. They attended the local Baptist church and later the Methodist church. And the sisters um, came into adulthood during the early 1900s when the progressive movement was in full force. And this movement, the progressive movement, was pus pushing for social reform, which was a response to industrialization. And this prog progressive movement was led mostly by women, for women. <laughs> um, women organized to reform, demanding change in the way of suffrage, prohibition, abolition, dress reform, et cetera. They organized in many different ways, but a very successful form of organization was women's clubs and women's organizations. The Women's Club Network was very powerful. So here's a photo of one of our local well-known and vocal organizers, Mary Alderson, you see there. Um, Mary was a white woman from Bozeman, and she is posing in this photo with the president of the National Women's Christian Temperance Union, Anna Gordon, you see there as well. Um, this photo was taken in Helena in 1916. Women's clubs um, of white women started organizing in Montana in 1890, and the Bozeman's women, the Bozeman Women's Club organized in 1910. The object of the, Mon the Bozeman Women's Club was to stimulate moral and intellectual development, to promote cordial and cultural relations among women, and to contribute to the welfare of the community. Of course, the McDonald sisters, nor any other woman of color, could join the Bozeman's Women's Club. It was socially restricted to them. So it wasn't, there was no law against them joining, there was no ordinance against them joining, but it was just socially unacceptable for them to join um, the Bozeman's Women's Club. Racism persisted, even in the most socially progressive movements of the era. And this was the case across the nation and of course across Montana. So black women began organizing their own women's clubs. So nationally, on the national scene, there was the National Association for Colored Women's Clubs that was formed in 1896. And then state, state federations became, began forming after that. These two women that I have pictured here uh, were national figures. Mary Church Terrell that you see here on the left, um, uh, and, then, and then Margaret Murray Washington who is pictured on the right. Mary Terrell was the first president of the National Association for Colored Women's Clubs and a national leader in the suffrage campaign and then later in the civil rights movement. Margaret Murray Washington was an anti-lynching activist and um, the principal of the Tuskegee Normal School, which then became the Tuskegee University. And also she was the third wife of Booker T. Washington. Montana women, of course, um, like, like black women nationally, wanted to join this club movement. It was a, an important movement. So in 1921, the Montana State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs was born in Montana. This group of women that you see right here were the women that made it happen. They got together, um, these women came from all over Montana, uh, and they came together in Butte in 1921, August 3rd through 5th, and organized the Montana State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. So um, this, originally this group was called um, the National Associate, or I'm sorry, the Montana Feder Federation of Negro Women's Clubs but um, they later changed their name to the Colored Women's Club. So just for simplicity, I'm gonna just um, call it the Colored Women's Club from now on. So what was this group? What, what was it and what did they do? The Montana Federation of Colored Women's Club, their motto was, their motto was unity and perseverance. So that gives you kind of a sense of, of what they were interested in what they did. Um, like I said, they organized on August 3rd through 5th in Butte, Montana. Uh, they were interested in cooperative work, betterment of the home, social, civic, and religious life. And in that realm, they gave scholarships to young black women to attend college. They donated books to libraries that featured African-American topics. They helped black community members when they were in need. But 
They also had a civil rights bent to them as well. They supported anti-lynching laws and legislation um, in Montana, but also throughout the nation. They would help other clubs in other states with that. They raised money for the NAACP, which was a national organization, of course. And then they supported civil rights and anti-discrimination legislation here in Montana as well. So I'll talk about all of that as we go on. But um, this, when this federation started, they organized 10 local clubs as well. So there was 10 local clubs throughout, Monta or throughout Montana. There was clubs in Kalispell, in Billings, in Helena, in Butte, in Great Falls. And there was even a club in Bozeman. And it was called the Sweet Pea Study Club. And so our local Sweet Pea Study Club was started on January 5th, 1921 with eight members and federated on November 5th of 1921, as you see here. And um, they, it had eight members to start with. Of course, this photo shows nine members. So this photo was probably taken a few years later, a little later in the 1920s. So the Sweet Pea Study Club was organized by this woman, Mrs. Eva Ellison Robinson. And she became the president of the club early on as well, this um, president of the Sweet Pea Study Club. Eva lived on North Bozeman Street in a house that is still standing. And if you come on our Family Matters um, walking tour, you'll, you'll get to see that house. And she lived in that house with her mother, Hattie Ellison, and her daughter, daughter Hattie Robinson. She also lived in the house with her husband, Andy, for a time, but um, they got divorced. Um, and so she didn't live with him in that house for very long. They lived in Bozeman until about 1930, 1935, when they moved to Salt Lake City. And I don't know why they moved to Salt Lake City, probably for more opportunity, for a um, better job, possibly. There's a lot of complex reasoning why um, the black community, Bozeman's black community was leaving, um, but they were leaving at that time in that 1920s, 1930s timeframe. So let's go back to this picture of the Sweet Pea Study Club again so that you can get a better look at these ladies. Um, you, I've been able to only identify two of these women. And you'll see Eva Robinson here in the center. And then I've also identified Melissa McDonald here um, to the right of Eva. I wonder if this might be Belle McDonald, but I'm not, I'm not 100% certain that that is Belle McDonald. But you'll see the other names of the other women up at the top of your screen that, um, that, that these probably, these women are. So there's Belle McDonald, Belle Fisher, which was the niece of Belle and Melissa. It was the daughter of Molly McDonald. There's Ada Smith, Beatrice Sims, Jesse, um, Jesse Bruce Atkinson, and Catherine Fish. Catherine Rogers Fish. So those are the women that I've identified that were part of the Sweet Pea Study Club over, the, over its life, over its existence. So hopefully someday I'll be able to tell you exactly who each of these ladies are in this photograph. But let's get back to the McDonald sisters for a time and talk a little bit about their involvement with the Sweet Pea Study Club and the State Federation. Molly seems to, the, of the three sisters, Belle, Melissa, and Molly, Molly is the one who is not as involved in the State Federation and the Sweet Peace Study Club, but Belle and Melissa are the two that are very involved. But Molly's daughter, Belle Fisher, that I have, you can see Belle Fisher right up here, she was involved as well. So Belle and Melissa attended conventions and they sat on committees, they gave addresses at the conventions, um, they gave, um, they participated in a lot of different ways, and I'll show you um, some different ways that they participated, just so you can get a feel for what happened at these conventions, these state federation conventions, but also kind of um, the, the McDonald sisters' involvement. So in 1926-27, Belle is the secretary of the Sweet Peas Study Club. 28, uh, 1928, Belle delivers an address during the afternoon session of the Anaconda Convention. And they had yearly conventions, so every year there was a convention in a different city in Montana. In 1929, Bell was the state chaplain for the Helena Convention. 
1930, Melissa McDonald was a, a member of the Bozeman Club, submitted um, to the state officers and local clubs um, the report covering activities undertaken since the last convention and outlined growth and membership projects and plans for the future. While Bell discussed better environment as a means of elevating the Negro child and improving its welfare and general health. In 1931, Melissa delivered the afternoon session, um, which she kind of facilitated that afternoon session, and Bell led a discussion of better, better environment in the home at the Billings Convention. In 35, Bell attended and gave the Negro in History Committee report. So that's just a snapshot. I'm sure that Bill and Melissa were doing a lot more, but that's kind of what I could glean from newspaper accounts and, and convention programs and things like that. But it gives you a sense of, of how closely they were involved in, in the conventions and in the Sweet Pea Study Club. So these conventions were really, really important to these women. These, these women would come from all over the state and they would gather for three days. They would um, discuss issues that were relevant to them and they would network. It was important gathering and especially important for women like Belle and Melissa who came from Bozeman where we had a fairly small African-American community. But it was, and so, and also women from Kalispell that had very small community. So it was really important to every one of these women and I'm sure it was a priority of theirs every year. Each of the conventions had a program like you see here, and they had ribbons. So you'll see the women um, wearing these ribbons, and you can see the ribbons here. The Montana Historical Society has some of these ribbons in their collection, which I think is really amazing. And um, during that time that I did the research for the Dave Walter uh, Fellowship, I was able to go through the Montana Federation of Colored Women's Club collection at Montana Historical Society and that's where all this all these photographs come from and that's where all these programs come from and everything that I'm presenting tonight um, kind of comes from so um, it's it's wonderful that they have been able to save all of that information um, but at these conventions the women got together they they ate together, they had meals together, they sang songs together, uh, they sang a lot of different songs, they had chants, and so they would do these, um, these chants as well. And so it must have just been a joyous um, gathering once a year. So as I was going through the Federation documents at the Historical so so Society, I found one small little line that said, Bozeman Convention, 1924. And I said, what? <laughs> there was a convention in Bozeman? I had no idea. And sure enough, in um, 1924, there was the fourth annual convention in Bozeman, Montana. So um, I had never seen any reference to this before. And so I was so glad to see that one little line reference in the, in the document. So I went to newspaper accounts and, and yes, sure enough, they had a, a meeting here in Bozeman, three day meeting. Um, 25 delegates attended from all over Montana. Eva Robinson from Bozeman was the historian and the organizer. The mayor, um, Bozeman's mayor, extended a welcome to the participants. M Mrs. Ada Smith, uh, who was a member of the Sweet Pea Study Club, welcomed the group on behalf of the Bozeman Club. Mrs. R.E. Brown, who was the president of the Bozeman Women's Club, the White Club, gave a talk um, called Encouraging the Negro Woman in Their Work and Suggesting Ways of Cooperating with Other Organizations. So um, there was also a welcome by Reverend Hayes St. Clair and um, Reverend St. Clair was a black man who lived here in Bozeman and he had lived with the McDonald's for a time. He boarded with them when he first came to Bozeman and was kind of getting his feet on the ground here. And he was a reverend, he was a minister at the Baptist Church here in Bozeman. And at this Bozeman Convention of the Montana Federation of Colored Women, they discussed how Negro women should use their vote. So that got me thinking. Um, these women must be voting here in Bozeman. They must be voting in Great Falls. They must be voting in Helena. And so um, I thought, well, there's probably documents that, that, 
that say that. And so I called Rachel Phillips and I, at the Gallatin History Museum and I said, Rachel, do you have any voting records from the, the late um, you know, 19 teens to 1920 time period? And she said, yes, we do. And so I went down and I looked at them. Rachel um, grabbed this book off the shelf for me. This is a ginormous book. It's about two, three feet by three feet wide. It weighs about 80 pounds. <laughs> and so she got it off the shelf for me and I looked at it. And this is the um, records of those who registered to vote from about 1916 to about 1926, 27, somewhere in there. And so I did a really quick perusal of it. I hope to go back and really look more in depth at this document. But I wanted to see if the women in the Sweet Pea Study Club were voting. And guess what I found out? They were. <laughs> so all of the women who are part of the Sweet Pea Study Club were voting during that time period. And um, Eva was voting, Eva's mom, Hattie Ellison was voting. Um, Ada Smith was voting, and then also the McDonald sisters were voting. So we have um, here, we have Belle McDonald that you see right up here, and we have Melissa McDonald that you see right down here. And of course, their address 308 South Tracy. So this got me to thinking and wondering, well, when black women were voting here in Bozeman, and also black men were voting here in Bozeman. So I um, there are voting records online from, I think it's 1900 to 1910. And I found a lot of our black male community members voting during that time. So we had, um, we did not have any restrictions to the, um, to the polls here in Bozeman. Um, that was not the case throughout the nation. Of course, a lot of the Jim Crow laws prohibited black people from voting, but I was glad to see that here in Bozeman, people were voting. So I called up a, um, a colleague, Ken Robeson, who is a historian who does a lot of research on the Great Falls African-American community. And I asked him if he saw that there were um, black community members voting in Great Falls. And so he went in and did a really cursory look at their records and found out that yes, they were voting in Great Falls as well. So it'll be interesting to dive into that a little bit more and kind of look at some other records in other parts of Montana and see what we find. So, so that was pretty exciting. Okay. So these women, the women pictured here, they had a powerful network and were always advocating for civil rights and anti-discrimination, even from the, the very beginning of this federation. In 1936, the Dunbar Art and Study Club of Great Falls presented a civil rights bill to the Montana legislature, but it was not given much consideration at that time, but that did not stop them. They continued to push. And in 1951, the Federation helped submit another bill to legislature, but unfortunately, another anti-discrimination bill to legislature, but unfortunately, that bill um, died in committee. But that did not stop them. They continued to push. And in 1955, they tried it again. And this time, they were successful. That bill passed in 1955. And that bill passed granting equal accommodations in public places to all people, regardless of race, creed, or color. Unfortunately, it passed as a different bill than it was submitted as. It passed um, after the Senate committee had taken away a lot of the penalty aspect of the bill. So it passed without penalties. And a lot of the women of the um, State Federation were were disappointed to say the least in this. They wanted that bill to pass with the penalties. They thought it would be much more effective that way and it would have been much more effective that way, but it was a victory nonetheless. And so during this time frame, um, in that 1940s, 1950s, early 1950s time frame, this women's club, the State Federation of Colored Women's Club was using their network to advocate for the, pass, the passing of these bills that they were helping to submit. And they did that through letter writing campaigns, through radio addresses. They gave their club members language in order to be able to speak 
eloquently to the public about this bill. And so I just wanted to give you some of that language or, or, or show you some of the quotes um, that I gleaned from that collection that's at the Montana Historical Society. Um, and so um, this first quote is from Alma Jacobs. And Alma Jacobs lived in Great Falls and she was a real advocate and she was a, a librarian um, for the Great Falls Library, but also she worked for a time at Montana State University's library. So, um, so she, and lived here in Bozeman as well. So um, Alma Jacobs says here, and this was taken from a script um, that she had for a radio address that her and another woman gave. It says um, she, and, and they were, they were giving examples of racism in Montana because of course the people who were, um, against this bill passing were saying, oh, there's no racism in Montana. We don't have any racism. There's no need for this anti-discrimination bill because we don't have any racism in Montana. So they were arguing against that in this. So she says, um, quote, one dress shop refused to let a Negro woman try on a dress. The clerk informed her she could buy the dress, but she would not be permitted to try it on before making her purchase. So that's one quote. Um, the second quote that I wanted to share, and this, this was language that was given to club members when they were talking to the public um, about this bill. And so this was a quote from um, Cecile Tucker. Failure of the state legislature to pass the bill is tragic when one considers the number of colored tourists who must drive day and night through our vast state without being able to find accommodations in motels or hotels. The governor's office and leading newspapers in the state have received complaints from motorists who have been forced to drive beyond the point of human endurance simply because no accommodations were available to them. A tired driver is an unsafe driver regardless of color. So um, two, more, two more points for you. Um, Cecile Tucker, um, I, actually this is the Cecile, Cecile Tucker um, quote, and she was from the Great Falls Dunbar Club, and she was writing a letter to a legislator saying, in 1949, when our state organization met in Helena, there was not a first-class hotel or restaurant that would serve us. That is the condition that exists in every city in Montana today, while our sons and brothers are fighting in Korea. Now, this last quote is the most powerful. And this again is from Cecile Tucker. The legacy, the, the, I'm sorry, the legality of the civil rights for all citizens is understood. But there are a couple of items that might have been overlooked and that might need some help to think. So number one, it has, has it occurred to those opposed to civil rights that Negroes were forced to be citizens? They were stolen from their native homes in Africa and brought here in chains. All other citizens came of their own free will. Two, miscegenation, the supposed result of intermingling, came before the Civil War and was not a product of civil rights. Usually, when the subject of civil rights comes up, the statement is made that to intermingle means to intermarry. Someone invariably always asks the question, how would you like your daughter to marry one of them? Anyone asking that question can come over and see my mother, and there are thousands of others, and see the result of this antebellum sin. This is truly a vital point that so few seem to think about. Mother is 90, she says. Now this is getting to the point that of course there was intermingling um, between the forced intermingling between slaves and their owners. And of course women were being raped by their owners. So there was this intermingling. And so the irony of the anti-miscegenation law um, is what she's pointing out. So three, this, she, she ends it on a, on a light note. This is Easter season, a splendid time to really put into practice the golden rule. So this language that these women are using is forceful and powerful, powerful language. And this just gives you an example of how these women were using their vote to fight for change in Montana. So some other things that they did um, is they compiled this cookbook. Now this is a more, um, this language that I just talked about um, was used during that kind of 1940s, 1950s time period. But earlier they put together this um, Montana Fed Federation of Negro Women's Clubs cookbook. And this is just as important. Um, this, this 
was a unifying, um, a way to unify their organization. And they did this by, of course, all women submitting recipes. And you've, and I'm sure everybody has seen a cookbook like this. Um, many church organizations do these. They're kind of called church cookbooks sometimes. But they compiled this cookbook, and it had recipes from all the women all over Montana. And it's a very intimate look into the lives of these women. And as historian Mary Murphy says, these primary documents give a glimpse of these women's lives, gives a very intimate glimpse into these women's lives. So I pulled a couple recipes just for you to see. And these are recipes that are from the book, from the, the cookbook. And these are recipes by Belle, Molly, and Melissa. And of course, Molly had a, a recipe or two in here. They had a lot, actually, all three of them had many recipes. Um, but Molly had a recipe, and of course, because she was a very good cook, but I'm sure they all were. So we have white salad by Miss um, Belle McDonald. We have chicken spaghetti by Mrs. Molly Gross. And then we have white cake by Miss Melissa McDonald. And so I tried um, the white cake, and I have to say it's very, very good. So you should, you should try it. Now, this whole cookbook is online for you to view. And um, it, it, the link is just right down here. And maybe Cheryl, you could grab that link and put it in the um, chat room so people can grab it if they want to, to have a chance to look at this cookbook. But it is, um, it's a great cookbook and you should look through the whole thing. And they have advertisers in the cookbook as well that kind of gives you some insight into some of the black businesses that were operating um, throughout the state during this time period. This is kind of 1926 time period. So um, the Federation started in 19. Well, I wasn't quite able to get that before you changed the slide. Oh, OK. No. I'll put it back here. Um, and also, could you make me the host again? Oh, sure. Can you do that while you're still sharing your slide? Yeah, let me see what I can do here. <laughs> Let's see if I can get back to it. I don't think I can um, while I'm sharing my slide. OK, if, could you just mute everyone then? Um, I don't think I can mute everybody because I'm sharing my slide, slides. Okay. Let me see if I can figure it out. Oh, maybe I can, here we go. Hang in there with us, everyone. <laughs> I, thought, I think you're the host still, Cheryl, so. Maybe if everyone I could got, just, you are. Okay. If everyone can can mute themselves. Sounds like we have someone making dinner out there or something. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you for muting. Okay. Um so the Federation started in 1921 with 10 clubs throughout the, the um, state of Montana. By 1961, there were four clubs remaining. The Phyllis Wheatley Club um, in Billings, the Pleasant Hour Club in Helena, and the Dunbar Club in Great Falls, and the Pearl Club in Butte. So Bozeman Sunset Hill Cemetery Club had kind of fallen, fallen away in the 1930s. I think with Eva Robinson leaving, they kind of, you know, kind of lost momentum. And of course, the McDonald sisters were getting fairly elderly by that point. So, so um, they, the Sweet Pea Study Club kind of fell away. By the late 1960s, it was time for the club, for the, the Federation, the State Federation, like other many, uh, other, many other women's clubs to close up shop. They had done what they needed to do. And these women felt satisfied with what they had accomplished. So just one year after their 50th anniversary, and this is their 50th annual anniversary convention uh, program that you see here on the left. And this is the, the woman uh, on the right is Mace, Ma Mammy Lacey. And she was the president of the Federation um, in 1971. So just one year after their 50th anniversary convention, the executive committee for the Montana Federation of Colored Women's Clubs met at the Esquire Motel in Billings, Montana, which I think might still be standing. They met on June 19th, 1972 to have their final meeting. Mrs. Arameta Duncan spoke of the need for each to reflect inwardly and the need for the brotherhood for brotherhood in the United States. 
President Lacey called for a motion for disbandment of the Federation and the adjournment of the executive board. The motion, um, there was a motion by Mrs. Alma Jacobs, seconded by Miss Oct Mrs. Octavia Bridgewater for disbandment and adjournment, and the motion carried. The meeting closed with the singing of Till We Meet Again, followed by a prayer. So that was the end of the um, Montana Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. And this is a article in the Billings Gazette kind of speaking to this and speaking, um, Mamie Lacey, the club president at that time, talked about, um, you know, that they hated to break up this group, but it wasn't needed anymore. Um, there were tears, but accomplishments with the work they did wasn't needed any longer. They had done what they set out to do. And, and so um, it, it's kind of, a, it's kind of um, bittersweet, isn't it? So coming back to the McDonald family, Belle and Melissa were not involved directly in the Federation in these later years, of course. In the, that time during the 1950s, they were no longer involved. They were getting older and they were staying close to home, but they were the ones who set the stage for this fight for anti-discrimination and for civil rights. They were the ones that helped build the organizational capacity to the degree where it could have a voice in Montana legislature. I'm sure most of you um, on, this, on this virtual lecture tonight have not heard the names of Melissa McDonald, Belle McDonald, Molly Gross, and the work they did with the State Federation and the Sweet Pea Study Club. And that's because they did their work quietly and effectively. Think of the barriers that these sisters overcame. They were strong and determined and resilient, and they made huge, huge changes in Montana, along with their colleagues in the Montana Federation of Colored Women's Clubs. Even though Belle and Melissa did not have children, their legacy lived on in Molly's daughter, Belle Fisher, or Little Belle as I, I call her. Belle Fisher was an active member of the State Federation and the Sweet Pea Study Club. She lived in Butte for many years, but came back to Bozeman to nurse her aunts and her mother in their final years. She took over the house at 308 South Tracy and lived there until she died in the year 2000. Gosh, I wish I could have met her. She had a best friend in Myrtle Newt who lived across the street. Myrtle's son Bob grew up knowing Belle and considered her part of the family. And you'll see um, Myrtle Newt on the left there on that bottom picture and then Belle Fisher on the right. At the end of Belle's life, Belle transferred the house at 308 South Tracy to Bob and his wife, Joanna, much to their surprise and a little bit to their chagrin, I think. <laughs> so when Bob and Joanna moved back to Montana from Minneapolis, Minnesota after they retired, they moved into the house and they currently live there today, taking care of not only the house, but also taking care of the legacy of the McDonald family. And Bob and Joanna are caretakers of one more very, very special item. And that is another cookbook, a very intimate object that once belonged to the McDonald women. This is a handwritten cookbook that holds the recipes of this family. I've had the honor to hold this in my hands, touching this book that more than likely Mary McDonald held, that more than likely Molly Bell and Melissa held, and that definitely Belle Fisher held. This is such a, it was, it's such a strong connection to these, to these women. It is also online at Montana State University's Special Collections website. You can see the link below there. So Cheryl, if you can grab that um, and, and um, copy that into the chat room, that would be awesome as well. Um, this is just online too. If you just Google um, the McDonald, um, Bell McDonald cookbook, um, you'll find this as well. And it's, the whole thing is online and I encourage you to look at it. Of course, this is a handwritten book. So it is, it is a treasure. So with that, I'd like to wrap up for the evening and thank you for so much for attending this virtual presentation tonight and letting me share my research. I hope this piques your interest to find out more about your historic neighbors of color 
in your community, wherever that may be out there. I'm also asking you to take action. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a call to action here to support people of color in your community. Continue the work that the Federation started. We still have racism in Montana and throughout the nation. Um, so we continue this work. So, so let's continue this work together in your own life. So reach out to your neighbors, especially your neighbors of color. Ask about their story. It may be fascinating, just like the McDonald's. So thanks everyone, thanks for coming tonight. I'll stick around for some questions if people have questions. And of course, thank you to everybody who helps with this research. Um, it, it always takes a village to do historical research, as I like to say. And if you want to continue to learn more uh, about um, racial equity in Montana, visit the Montana Racial Equity Projects website, which is listed here. If you wanna learn more about the Black Montana's Black community, um, go to the Montana's African American Heritage Resources site on the, at the Montana Historical Society. So with that, I'll take some I'll take some questions. Okay, we do have some questions in the chat. So again, just a reminder: if you have questions, you can post them up there. Um, but first, uh, we have uh, what was the newspaper coverage of the club like, and were there any concerns that uh, you could infer from that coverage? Yeah, so there was a lot of coverage of the um, Federation meetings, those annual meetings, um, especially in the Anaconda Standard. Um, the Anaconda, Sta Anaconda Standard was a powerful and huge newspaper for many of the years that the Federation was active. And so they would always talk about what was happening at the Federation conventions. Um, but a lot of the other newspapers, the Butte newspapers would cover it, the Bozeman newspaper of, co of course covered the 1924 convention here in Bozeman. Um, so they would, they would speak about these conventions and talk about who was there. That's where I got a lot of information about Bell and Melissa attending these conventions because um, they would say who was doing what at the convention. So they were very, they were pretty well covered. Um, so yeah, good question. Could, could you get a sense of like the primary issues of concern that they were discussing at these conventions? Yeah. Like I know you know you mentioned the voting and yeah. So so that um, so they were often talking about the betterment of their their community of the black community. How to better their community. So um, how to use your vote, like the one from the the Bozeman convention. They would talk about. Um, uh, how to educate their community. Education was huge, so they were always doing presentations on education and respectability. They were trying to, um, the, the motto of the National Association of Colored Women was lifting as we climb. And so that kind of gives you a sense as well as to what they were, they were working on. And of course, then they would, um, they were working on anti-discrimination legislature as well. And so they would speak about that. They would educate themselves in order to educate their community. Okay. Um, and then just a clarification question. Is it Bob and Joanna Newt that live in the McDonald House today? Yes, they, okay. they live there today. And, um, right. and they are, um, it, it, they, they um, are the ones who um, most of the photos in this presentation came from, and and they um, have a, some a few other special artifacts from the McDonald family as well. And so, like I said, they caretake the legacy of these of this family. And then another question is: Did uh, Little Bill have any children, and are there descendants of the Bozeman McDonalds? So there are no descendants. Um, but um, Little Belle was the end of the the family, so she she was the last one, and um, when she died, there was no more descendants um, of the McDonald family. So she was the last of the line here in here in Bozeman. Um, I do know that Richard McDonald came to Montana with a brother, um, and so there's probably other descendants out there in the world. But I haven't, I haven't started um, doing that genealogical research um, to figure that out. And I'll probably need some help with that, Barbara, to, <laughs> to, to figure that out. But <laughs> um, yeah, so there probably are other descendants out there, but I have not, have, I have not found them yet. 
Okay. And then Mary is curious if you found anything on Molly's life in Butte or Livingston and particularly was she still working as a cook? Yeah, so she cooked, she cooked everywhere she went, she was a cook. And so in Livingston, she worked as a cook. Um, in Butte, she worked as a cook. And then of course she worked at MSU as, a, as the head cook at ha Hamilton Hall for 20 years. So, um, so she always was a cook, she was always cooking, but I haven't found out anything more, Mary, than what I've shared with you. So okay. I'll, keep my, I'll keep my eyes open though. <laughs> Thank you, Crystal. <laughs> Next question is, do you have any idea of where the women stayed when they went to conventions, given that public accommodations were few and far between? Yeah, I was wondering about that myself. That's a good question. And, you know, they did have a hard time finding accommodation. And, um, and so I'm kind of curious. I haven't been able to figure this out yet, but I kind of wonder if they stayed in the homes of the women who lived in Helena or Great Falls or wherever the the um, convention was being held. But that is a good question that I don't know the answer to. Hey, uh, do you know if the churches uh, were integrated in Bozeman at that time? They were, they were. So we never had a dedicated um, church for the African-American community. We did, we did have a Methodist Episcopal church that many of the um, black community members went to, and that was on the north side of town over on um, 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 Church Street. Um, church and Lammy, I think it is. It's that corner building. It's still standing. It's a brick building. It was a Salvation Army building for a long time. And so they, um, that was their church, the Mes Methodist Episcopal Church for a time, and they went there. But other communities like Butte and Great Falls had um, uh, um, AME churches that were dedicated to the Black communities, but we, we, did, we had an integrated church in Bozeman. Okay. I'm going to skip over Jan's question just for a minute because I think hers is a good final question. Um, so don't worry, Jan, I'm coming back to you. Um, Leslie wants to know how long the National Federation lasted. Um, oh, Leslie, that's a really good question. Let me try to think if I've, I've read that. I haven't, but I'll let you know. And then when did the... I take that back. It's still in operation. It's still operating. It's still because I've, I gleaned some stuff from their website. So they are still active and they still have state federations in some states throughout the nation. Okay, when did the KKK become most highly active in Montana and in Bozeman? Yeah, so kind of the 1910 time frame is when they were becoming more active in Montana. And um, they were active, they were, they were fairly active in Billings and Livingston, um, not as much in Bozeman, but they were around, and of course other parts of Montana as well. But one thing I always find interesting about the KKK in Montana is that um, they had a women's auxiliary, and the women's auxiliary aspect was really um, very popular in Montana, and so a lot of women joined that women's auxiliary of the KKK. So, um, so go figure. <laughs> Kind of a kind of the same idea as the women's clubs, you know, in Montana. And of course, they, at that point, they had a push for um, they weren't they were um, they were against um, Catholics and the Irish as well. So that's what they really pushed against here in Montana. All right, and then with with one minute to go. Here's, here's a good wrap up question for you. Okay. There is a long road to Black Lives Matter. What do you think these sisters would think about today's activism? You kind of cut out Cheryl right at the oh. end. Can you repeat it? <laughs> yeah. So Jan Strout's question is there is a long road uh, from this period to Black Lives Matter. And uh, what do you think these sisters would think about today's mm -hmm. activism? Well, Jan, that's a really good question. And of course, um, these women, like the McDonald sisters and the women who were joining the Montana Federation of Colored Women's Clubs in 1921, um, they lived in a, in a somewhat different world than we live in today. But um, they had to 
you know, I named this the quiet resilience because these women um, had to be quiet. If they didn't, they may die um, or they may um, have violence against them. So um, they, they were fighting much as black women are fighting in this, in this movement today. And that kind of goes back to my, to the, to what I said at the very end is that, um, you know, things have changed, but things have not changed. Um, we still have racism in this country and we still have people who are saying there is not racism in Montana. Um, I, I see that, I see that quote every day on Facebook. So, um, you know, things change, but things stay the same. So they would be active members. Um, they would be, they would be actively educating their community, I'm sure today, just like they did then. Okay. Well, I'll leave the chat open. If anyone has a few final questions, we can maybe have Crystal address them at a later point. Um, or if I missed over anything, we'll take a look back and make sure that you get your questions answered. Um, but I guess uh, with that all wrapped up, thank you very much, uh, Crystal. This was fantastic. Um, we will be recording this, right? And where can people find the recording? So we will, re we are recording. Well, I mean, we are recording it. <laughs> yep, and we'll put it up on our YouTube, the Extreme History Project YouTube channel. So, um, and we'll also post it on our Facebook page and on our website. Um, so, but the easiest way, just Google Extreme History Project um, YouTube and you'll come to our YouTube page and it'll be the first video on there as of probably tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, so share Thank it. Thank you very much. Yeah, share it with everybody. Thanks everyone for coming. Have a great evening. Right. Nice to see some of you. I would unshare my screen, but I can't figure out how to do it. Oh, here we go. Okay, there. Now I can see everybody again. <laughs> Good to see you all. Have a good all night. Right.